I know a place that's peaceful and quiet. A place where animals play. Slaughter is a tiny town in Louisiana with a population of just under 900 residents. On January 3rd, 2022, a call was placed to emergency services. The woman making the call was one Sheila Fletcher. Sheila informed emergency services that her daughter, Lacey, had just recently passed away at their home. Lacey was only 33 years old. Soon, police and ambulance services arrived at the scene, where they were greeted by the owners of the home, 64-year-old Sheila and 65-year-old Clay Fletcher. However, upon making entry to the home, first responders knew immediately that there was something more than meets the eye going on here but they had no idea just how deep and dark this particular rabbit hole would actually go. As soon as they were across the threshold, first responders were hit with the strong smell of both urine and feces. Moving further into the home, EMTs eventually discovered the lifeless body of Lacey Fletcher lying on the downstairs sofa. The corpse was in a truly horrendous state. Lacey's body was so sunken into the couch that it was obvious she had been lying there for a very long time. Her entire body was covered in insect bites and multiple sores that had rotted down to the very bone. Large red blotches adorned her face, and horrifically, every inch of her was caked in feces even the inside of her ears. Horribly, Lacey's entire body was also covered in maggots. An autopsy report later revealed that the poor woman's cause of death was due to numerous reasons, including chronic malnutrition, acute starvation, and a bone infection that eventually led to sepsis. Judging from the evidence provided, it was theorized that Lacey had likely been left to rot on that sofa for 12 long years. Personally, I can't even imagine that kind of hell. The poor girl only weighed 96 pounds at the time of her death. Some sources would later report that Lacey was suffering from a rare neurological disorder known as locked-in syndrome. This condition causes a person to become paralyzed as all voluntary muscles except for the eyes cease to work. However, some sources claim that this diagnosis is false, but what is certain is that Lacey suffered from anxiety and severe autism. Following the discovery of the body, the parents were taken in and questioned by the authorities, who wanted to know exactly how Lacey had come to be in such a horrid state. Eight. Both the parents assured the suspicious police that their daughter was very well taken care of on their watch. I mean, obviously. The two claimed that Lacey's anxiety was such a problem for her, she simply refused to move from the sofa. They described how Lacey would urinate and defecate on towels that she kept next to the sofa, while simultaneously asserting that their daughter was sound of mind before she passed. By their own twisted logic, they asserted that since Lacey never complained to them about her condition, that she was really fine with it and could leave whenever she she pleased. However, the district attorney didn't quite see it in the same way. He, for one, is certain that Lacey must have been in an incredible amount of pain. In fact, the DA would go on to state that he firmly believed Lacey's parents intended to murder her through neglect. The local sheriff, Jeffrey Travis, also made a statement saying, I have been the sheriff here for six years, and I have seen a lot of things happen, but this is by far the worst. Thus, it came as no surprise to anyone that on April 2nd of the year 2022, both Clay and Sheila were taken into custody. Now, these two weren't the backwards hicks that you might have been picturing. In fact, both parents were well-respected members of society. Sheila, in particular, was involved in local politics and even worked in law enforcement at one point. 
Clay, on the other hand, worked for a nonprofit charity. Both had more than enough resources to provide adequate care for their daughter. Once the case had hit the local news, various neighbors came forward to say that they hadn't seen a single sign of Lacey for at least 15 years. Her parents claim that around the age of 14, Lacey's autism accelerated to the point where she required homeschooling. Medical records later revealed that Lacey did not have a primary care physician. In 2010, the parents went to the doctor alone. They were looking for advice on what to do about their daughter, saying that Lacey was becoming a recluse, never wanting to leave the living room sofa. The doctor advised them to bring Lacey to the hospital immediately. However, she was never admitted and no treatment was provided. During the months of April and May, the couple were brought before a grand jury. That jury found sufficient cause to charge both parents with the murder of their daughter. The jury was shown actual photos of Lacey laying covered in her own excrement. These photos were so disturbing that medical personnel had to be on standby as they were shown. In the end, on the day of May 2nd, 2022, the couple were charged with second-degree murder. Sickeningly, however, the couple were released to await trial after posting $300,000 bond each. Infuriatingly, the couple's lawyer was able to get the charges against them tossed out due to a technicality. However, maybe there is a god, because luckily, on June 19th, the couple were charged again. <laughs> Children, is there anything as precious? They say there's nothing stronger than a mother's love. Panicked, desperate mothers have even been known to lift entire cars off of their pinned and trapped children. But could some go even further than that? There are those who believe that if the danger to their children is grave enough, certain mothers can actually return from the dead. So, if you're lucky enough to have safe and healthy children of your own, I want you to look at them and I want you to think. Think, is there anything that I wouldn't do to save my child's life? In the year 1994, Christine Skubish was a 33-year-old mother living with her toddler son Nick in Sacramento, California. Christine's life was currently on an upswing. She had recently just earned her paralegal certification and was just about to embark on an exciting and challenging new career. And it wasn't just her work life that was looking up either. She had recently become engaged to Nick's biological father. However, despite all of these blessings, she had no way of knowing what was coming. At midnight on June 5th, 1994, Christine and Nick left upon a fateful journey that would change both of their lives forever. And so, they set off into the night, heading down Highway 50 through the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Their destination was Carson City, Nevada, which was around a three-hour journey from from their home. Christine was on her way there in order to spend a few days visiting with a close friend. Unfortunately, however, Christine and Nick never made it there. 
They vanished somewhere between their home in Carson City. On June 8th, Dave, Christine's stepfather, received a call from the friend that Christine was supposed to be visiting with. This friend explained to Dave that Christine and Nick were supposed to arrive in Carson City by Monday, but now it was Wednesday and no one had seen or heard from them. So together, they phoned all of the nearby hospitals, but to no avail. Neither Christine nor her young son had been admitted to any of them. Naturally, Dave assumed that the pair had crashed their car somewhere between Sacramento and Carson City. At this point, Dave decided to involve the authorities and report the two as missing. If they were going to find Christine and Nick still alive, then time was of the utmost importance. For the weather in that season consisted of blisteringly hot days and frigidly cold nights. So, the two wouldn't last long if they were exposed to the elements for any great length of time. Up and down, back and forth, deputies scoured every inch of the highway that they knew Christine would have taken on her way to Carson City. But unfortunately, there was no sign of her vehicle and no trace of a possible crash. For two full days, investigators searched aimlessly until finally they received a tip. This tip was called in by a woman named Deborah Hoyt. You see, on Friday, the same night that Christine and Nick disappeared, Deborah and her husband had been driving along Highway 50 when they noticed something horrific laying on the side of the road the nude body of a deceased woman. The body was positioned on its side, with her blank stare facing the roadway. The woman appeared to be covered in blood, and bizarrely, she was completely nude. A more startlingly scary sight I could not imagine. Deborah and her husband were understandably suspicious that this could be some sort of trap or setup and so they didn't stop to investigate any further. Instead, they continued driving until they reached a payphone and contacted the authorities. Two officers were then dispatched to where Deborah stated that she had seen the dead woman, which was a stretch of road called Bully and Bend. After arriving, however, to the officers' complete bewilderment, they found no woman at all either alive or dead. The following morning, the Skubish family caught wind of this strange report to the police and immediately thought of Christine. The family then begged the authorities to return to that bit of highway and investigate further. So, the detectives agreed to conduct a much more thorough search now that they had the advantage of daylight to aid them. After all, this was a mother and her very young son who were missing. Soon after after arriving at Highway Post 16, an officer found a startling and quite ominous clue. The discarded shoe of a young boy laying on the side of the road. Following his natural instincts, the officer looked over the ledge and railing to the very bottom of the steep ravine. And there, hidden deep within the brush, was Christine Skubish's wrecked vehicle. Missing its entire upper half, the car was in quite bad shape. It was obvious to the officer that Christine must have hit the embankment traveling at a great speed. Strangely, there were no tire marks leading up to the ledge. It was as though she had hit it full throttle, with no sign whatsoever of braking. Immediately, the officer raced to the bottom of the ravine in order to reach the vehicle, but nothing could have prepared him for what he saw when he looked inside. Christine Skubish's lifeless body was hanging in the driver's seat, still securely buckled up. The officer then spotted Nick himself, curled up in the fetal position on the passenger seat. The young boy lay completely still, and his skin was tinged with the bluish hue. Assuming the boy was already dead, the officer reached out to feel for a pulse to confirm, and as he did so, Nick took a shallow breath. Somehow, the toddler was still clinging to life. Immediately, the officer radioed for medical assistance. Thank you.
and Nick was rushed to the nearest hospital. As doctors raced to save Nick's life, investigators began trying to piece together what exactly happened. And it wasn't very long before they came up with a theory. The investigators reasoned that sometime on June 6th, after 2 a.m., Christine must have fallen asleep at the wheel. And so, for five long days, her vehicle lay hidden in the ravine, unseen by any passing motorist. Nick's little shoe must have flown out the window as they crashed. Astoundingly, the toddler survived his horrific ordeal. He was incredibly lucky. Just a few more hours in that car and he would not have lived. And it all comes back around to Deborah Hoyt. If she had never called in that tip about the dead woman on the side of the road, then Nick never would have been found. And right therein lies the great mystery of this case. Who was the woman that Deborah saw that night? After all, Christine's body was found still buckled up in her car at the bottom of the ravine. The coroner later confirmed that she had died instantly upon impact. And so, it obviously would have been impossible for her to have ever left the vehicle. Could it be that Christine loved her young son so much that she returned from the dead in order to save him? Some people certainly think so. Could her spirit have really made it up that ravine and somehow signaled for help? It's possible, but there are some more down-to-earth explanations out there. Some people think that the whole thing might have just been a bizarre prank. That for some reason, a woman just covered herself in fake blood and laid down on the side of the road to get a laugh. And somehow, she just happened to pick the exact spot where Christine and Nick had wrecked. Personally, I feel that this theory is pretty far-fetched. After all, that would have to be one hell of a coincidence. Another theory is that Deborah Hoyt had accidentally run Christine off the road herself. And then, five days later, her conscience got the better of her, and so she called the authorities and made up a bizarre story. I also don't believe that this one is very likely. The most realistic theory to me is that Deborah didn't see a dead woman on the side of the road at all. What she actually saw that night was Nick himself. Warm from the afternoon sun, this theory states that Nick took off his own clothes and climbed to the top of the ravine, where Deborah then saw him and mistook him for a grown woman. I'm not really sure how likely this theory is either. Could a three-year-old really have made it all the way up the side of that ravine to the roadway? and then back down to the vehicle again? We'll probably never know for sure what actually occurred that night. However, there is one more interesting detail to take note of. Nick himself would later recall that each and every night that he was trapped in the vehicle, he had seen the hazy outline of a woman watching over him from the roadside. Could this have been Christine herself, still watching over her young son? Or is it just wishful thinking on Nick's part? I think it's pretty safe to say that we'll never know for sure. At least until we take that final trip ourselves. My little puppy comes completely unhouse trained and enjoys being taken for lots of walks. He's crazy! He's my little puppy. Love and attention. And when all the fun's over, it's easily stored away. On May 24, 2004, at an engineering consulting firm in Denver, Colorado, an employee did not show up for work. Now, normally, this wouldn't be too unusual. However, the employee in question Al Kite was known to be a paragon of responsibility. So obviously his absence set off some alarm bells. Al was rarely ever even late, let alone absent altogether. 
So when mere minutes turned into hours, Al's co-workers began to grow nervous. This was just very unlike him. And so the co-workers attempted to reach him by phone, but to no avail. After multiple calls failed to reach Al, his company decided to try his emergency contact, which was his sister, Barbara, who resided in Virginia. The company did succeed in reaching Barbara, but unfortunately, she informed them that she hadn't heard or seen any sign of her wayward brother. By this point, real alarm was growing. Finally, in desperation, Barbara herself decided to involve the authorities. She asked the Aurora Police Department to perform a welfare check at her brother's home. After all, she herself was thousands of miles away from where he lived. And so, later that same afternoon, police arrived at Al's residence. Upon the front door, they knocked several times, but received no response in return. Although the house looked fairly normal, the officers were afraid that something might have happened to Al, and so they entered the premises. Once inside, however, everything appeared to be fairly normal, with nothing much out of place. But then the officers decided to check out the basement, and it was there where they made a gruesome discovery. Al's home was rather large for just one person, and so he decided to turn the basement into a furnished apartment and rent it out. Sadly, that fateful decision would soon prove to be a grave mistake. Following his first tenant moving out after a few years of living there, Al placed multiple advertisements into local newspapers in order to locate a new renter. And on May 19, 2004, a man responded to Al's ads, and he seemed to be very interested in the apartment. This man told Al that his name was Robert, and he wanted to move in almost immediately. This so-called Robert offered to provide Al with a security deposit, as well as the first month's rent, if that would help matters move along both quickly and smoothly. Al told his girlfriend at the time, named Linda, all about this alleged would-be tenant. Supposedly, he had just moved to the East Coast in order to begin working at a bank. This man informed Al that he was already staying at his sister's house for the time being, which is why he needed a place as soon as possible. On one occasion, Linda actually saw this man with her own two eyes, but unfortunately she wasn't able to get a good look at his face. The single time that the two were around one another, Linda had to use the bathroom, and in that brief span of time that it took her, the man had already left. Although Linda wasn't able to get a good look at this mysterious man's face, she was able to later recall in detail the kind of clothing that he was wearing. She stated that he was dressed very nicely, in good pants and even a suit jacket. In addition to all of these useful details, this man was described as having dark hair, standing about 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighing around 180 pounds, and being in his mid-40s. The signature element of the description, however, was a slightly more strange one. The man was said to walk with a pronounced limp. He even made use of a cane in order to help balance himself. However, there were others besides just Linda who reported encountering this same man. A local professor who was renting out a property that she owned stated that a man who exactly matched the physical characteristics of Robert Cooper met with her to discuss possibly renting the property. Bizarrely though, this man did not carry a cane or even walk with a limp for that matter. Another strange detail was that this man spoke with what seemed to be a Romanian accent. Apparently, this same man had contacted several local landlords in the days and weeks prior to his meeting with Al. As many as three different renters could recall having encounters with this same man. 
but all three of them described him very differently. For each encounter, he displayed different characteristics, different mannerisms, and ways of speaking. It's now quite clear that this man was utilizing different personas for each and every one of these meetings. This shows a very high degree of organization and planning. For example, one witness described the man as being in his 30s, whereas another claimed that he was in his early 50s. Maybe now you're beginning to see just why it is that this case is still unsolved and continues to baffle experts to this very day. One of Al's neighbors reported seeing a strange man leaving Al's house on the 19th of May, and so the authorities were able to determine that this was the first time that the two had made contact. Shortly after this initial meeting, the two reached an agreement. This supposed Robert Cooper would pay half of the first month's rent as well as a security deposit. This would allow him to move in almost immediately. May 22nd was a Saturday, and in the morning, Al drove his girlfriend to the airport. Linda was leaving on a week-long trip. The couple made arrangements for her to phone Al when she had arrived at her destination. So when Linda landed later that afternoon, she gave Al a call. She later reported that her boyfriend seemed to be in a good mood as he informed her that he just fixed a pipe in the basement. All too soon, the couple wished each other a nice weekend and said their goodbyes, not knowing that this would be the last time they ever spoke. Two days later, Al missed work and the authorities were notified. And all this led to the police entering the basement of Al's home. And it was there that sadly they'd find the deceased body of Al Kite. His body was laying face down in the middle of a crime scene that was incredibly gruesome. Blood splatter found around the walls indicated that Al's death had been very violent indeed. The lead detective on the case was a Thomas Sebesky of the Aurora Police Department. And I'm sorry if I just butchered that name. He would later describe the crime scene as one of the very worst that he'd ever seen. A wound on the back of Al's head indicated that he'd been hit from behind. Police soon realized that Al had died very badly indeed. This was no average run-of-the-mill homicide. This was torture. Al's hands and feet had been bound behind his back with the cord. From that point onwards, the attacker had complete control over him, and he used it to mercilessly torture him for hours on end. Eventually, however, death came for Al Kite. 22 stab wounds to his torso finally put Al out of his misery. Following this absolutely brutal murder, the killer then proceeded to eat food from Al's kitchen, nap in his bed, and even shower in his bathroom. The brazen criminal even wore some of Al's clothes. The killer finally left sometime early Sunday morning, but only after conducting a thorough cleaning of the whole residence. The house was wiped clean of all fingerprints, with bleach having been poured down every single drain. The first step for investigators was figuring out a motive for this heinous crime. At first, the severity of the attack lended credence to it being a crime of passion, but the detectives quickly moved off of this theory. I mean, no one in Al's life even disliked him, let alone wanted to torture him to death for hours. Initially, Al's vehicle was missing which lended some weight to the theory of robbery, but that was soon ruled out after the vehicle was located. Although the killer had stolen it and then dumped it later, unfortunately, nothing of much substance was found within the vehicle. However, when searching through Al's home trash can, authorities found what appeared to be a discarded rental application. This form had seemingly been handwritten by the mysterious Robert Cooper and contained his alleged mailing address, phone number, 
and social security number. The address provided actually belonged to a building on the University of Colorado's medical school's campus, and all of the other information was similarly false. The phone number given was active, however, it belonged to a burner phone. Both this phone and Al's own phone were later found, having been discarded in an area of Denver known as Five Points. You see, while authorities couldn't glean any really useful information from it due to its nature as a burner phone, they were at least able to track its physical location. And of course, they could trace Al's phone, which the killer had obviously stolen. As always though, this criminal was smart and strategic with where he had discarded the two phones. This particular area was a hot spot for the homeless, and the killer knew that if he left the phones there unattended, they would likely be picked up and used by multiple vagrants. However, the police were at least able to determine that the phone had been bought at a location that was near to the college. This possible link to the University of Colorado Medical School would become one of the authorities' only real leads. Next, the police discovered, following a quick check of Al Kite's financial records, that his ATM card had been used extensively on the night of his murder, following his time of death. Luckily, the ATM that the killer had used had a working camera that was up and running that night. With it, the authorities got their first real look at their suspect. However, once again displaying his sick talent for this, the killer had obstructed his face with a ski mask. Only a very small section of his face was actually visible. The killer also made sure to wear gloves during the transaction, thereby ensuring there would be no usable fingerprints to recover. Despite Al's bank account containing many thousands of dollars, the suspect only withdrew an even thousand, solidifying the authorities' conclusion that this was not a robbery. After dumping the stolen vehicle, the killer returned to Al's residence and soaked the keys in bleach, removing any evidence. All of this painted a very bleak picture of what actually happened that day. It seemed that the killer had planned all of this out far in advance and had tortured and killed Al Kite just for the fun of it. For their part, the authorities believed that Al was targeted simply because he lived all alone and didn't have many close friends or family in the area. Because of the high degree of organization the killer had displayed during the committing of his crimes, the authorities felt pretty certain that he'd done this before. In other words, this wasn't his first rodeo. However, due to the various neighbor sightings and the footage from the security camera, a composite sketch of the suspect was created, and you can find that online. Al Kite's funeral service took place on the 2nd of June, 2004. He was laid to rest in the church cemetery, where he remains resting to this very day. His murder is still unsolved. You see this paper? This isn't just any old paper. With this paper, you can become the new king or queen of a small European country of your choice. With established monarchs, you could become royalty today. For six easy payments of $69.69. For six easy payments of $69.69, you can become the new ruler of a whole sovereign nation. That's the power of this paper. So pay up. And soon you can get to decorating your throne room. Established monarchs. Thank you.
The Lighthouse is a 2019 film from Robert Eggers, starring Robert Pattinson and William Dafoe. The film tells the story of two extremely isolated lighthouse keepers who slowly descend into madness. The Lighthouse performed well with both audiences and critics. However, not many people know that the film is actually based on a true story. A true story that is arguably more disturbing and terrifying than the film itself. Solitude. Only a few people know what this word really means. Astronauts aboard a space station, researchers in Antarctica, prisoners in solitary confinement, and at least in the early 1800s lighthouse keepers. Before automation, lighthouse keepers were stuck in the middle of the sea, on tiny little islands of desolate rock, sometimes for months on end, with little to no contact with the outside world. Similar to prisoners trapped in their cells, lighthouse keepers were stuck on tiny little windswept islands of barren rock in the middle of the ocean. These men were entirely at the mercy of outside forces, completely dependent upon them if they should ever have need of rescue. Oftentimes, the water surrounding the islands was so deep and so cold that it made simply swimming away from them nigh but impossible. The keepers themselves were paid reasonably well for this work, but adequate compensation simply did not negate the negative psychological and traumatic effects of the job. There are many extremely isolated lighthouses placed throughout the various oceans and great lakes of the world. A strong contender for the most isolated, however, is Small's Lighthouse, located off the coast of Pembrokeshire, Wales. Except for one other lighthouse that can be found in the midst of Lake Superior, Small's Lighthouse is the one that is farthest from people anywhere on Earth. In fact, over 30 kilometers separate it from the nearest inhabited area, and the conditions upon this tiny island can become absolutely inhospitable, with the waters sometimes enveloping the entirety of the land, leaving only the lighthouse itself rising up from the murky depths. It is so isolated, in fact, that from the very top you can see nothing but icy water surrounding you for leagues in every direction. And even even the structure of the lighthouse itself isn't necessarily guaranteed to be a reprieve from the harsh conditions. In only mild waves, the island can become completely submerged, with the worst of the storms bringing with them walls of water that are incomprehensibly gigantic. As a matter of fact, in the year 1831, the island was hit by a storm so severe that the waves grew large enough to crash into the floor of the structure. The force of that wave was so great that it sent the floor crashing into the ceiling above it, instantly killing one lighthouse keeper. But that is a tale for another day, my friends. Right now, we're focused on an even stranger and somehow more ghastly event. And the results of this incident would change the rules of lighthouse keeping forevermore. Construction of the original Smalls Lighthouse was completed in the year 1776. It was a gigantic, octangular structure resting upon eight large oaken pillars. But alas, even this would prove to not be sturdy enough, and so one more additional support was added to the center. On the rocks below it, a large tank was placed, which would hold both hot and cold water. The lowest level was divided and sectioned off into rooms for storage as well as living quarters for the keepers themselves. The uppermost level contained the light and reflectors which could consume over a thousand gallons of oil a year. This light was so bright that it could be seen by passing vessels up to 33 kilometers away. It's sort of ironic that something so dark could happen in a place designed to bring light to the world. Just something to think think about. In the year 1801, two men named Thomas Griffith and Thomas Howe were the lighthouse keepers on duty at Smalls. But, other than sharing a first name and a profession, these two men seemed to not have very much in common at all. 
In fact, they were known to get into many arguments and sometimes even outright physical brawls. However, the pay was decent enough for them both to accept the job. And from the very beginning, things didn't go so well. For instance, the weather on the tiny island was unseasonably rough. It was so bad, in fact, that not a single ship could safely dock on the island for four very long months. The men's families and loved ones were extremely worried over this, and as it turns out, rightfully so for there were dark and disturbing events occurring in Small's lighthouse. For months, rescue ships were sent to the Isle, but the rough waters surrounding it were just too dangerous. And so, the two men remained trapped, entirely isolated from the outside world. Following a particularly awful storm, nearby sailors noticed that the lighthouse's distress beacon had been lit. However, due to the limitations of the technology at the time, this was nothing more than an indistinct signal. And thus, the nearby sailors had no way of knowing what exactly went wrong on the island, but only that something had. Again and again, they attempted to breach the isle, and again and again, they failed miserably. This must have been incredibly frustrating for everyone involved. Week after week, ships would get close to the island, only to be forced to turn back by the severity of the water's condition. And almost every sailor that drew near reported back the same thing that they'd spotted the hazy, indistinct figure of a man standing on the gallery, occasionally appearing to wave at them as they passed by. However, all was not as it seemed. Unfortunately, these would-be rescue vessels could never get close enough to the shore to hear anything that the man might be yelling at them. And what's worse is that both the rescuers and the families of the stranded men knew without a doubt that their supplies must be draining away. Time was running out. But there was just nothing at all that they could do to help. And so, they were forced to just remain vigilant and wait for the dismal weather to change at long last. The only hope that the family still clung to was that the distress beacon had never gone out. You see, at this time, these signals weren't automated and thus obviously had to be maintained by somebody. Someone up in that tower was still alive, but reaching them was proving most difficult. If that light had extinguished, so too would the last hopes of everyone involved. Can you even imagine having no idea whatsoever what could have befallen your loved one for four excruciatingly long months? Everyone involved in this situation was extremely worried about what they just might find when they finally reached the island. But the reality of the situation was far more disturbing and horrific than they could have ever imagined. Trust me folks, this is the stuff that nightmares are made of. But finally, at long last, gentler weather arrived, and with it, calmer seas. After four grueling months, a rescue ship finally managed to dock on the island. And finally, the truth of the situation was revealed. You see, not long after the two men were first dropped off at the lighthouse, Thomas Griffith became very ill. Very ill, indeed. The other Thomas did his very best to care for his ailing partner, but due to their lack of supplies and the severity of Griffith's illness, his condition just continued to deteriorate, causing the men to raise the distress signal. And unfortunately, because of terrible weather preventing any help from reaching the Isle, Griffith just got worse and worse until he finally passed away some short weeks later. And now Thomas Howe was faced with a truly horrific dilemma what to do with the body. At first, he simply left it in the lighthouse with him, but due to obvious reasons, this was untenable. Eventually, the ghastly sights and smells of a decomposing corpse forced Hal to come up with a different plan. The first and most obvious solution would have been to simply dump the body into the ocean. 
a sort of DIY burial at sea. However, due to it being common knowledge that the two men didn't get along very well at all, Hal was worried that once back upon dry land, he might be accused of cold-blooded murder. Obviously, this was a fate that the man greatly wished to avoid. And so, Hal decided to put his barrel-making skills to good use and fashion Griffith a makeshift coffin. After it was finished, Hal placed Thomas's body inside of it and carried it out to the gallery. There, he tied the coffin to the railing so that it would be tight and secure. At first, this seemed to work, but because of exposure to both rain and wind, slowly the wooden coffin eroded away. In the end, all that remained still strung up to the railing was the decomposing, partially skeletal corpse of Thomas. Griffith. And quite disturbingly, the body was held in a position where it appeared to be standing, and occasionally, due to gust of wind, even waving at passing ships. This is what all those sailors had really seen, not someone attempting to signal for help. For four long months, Thomas Howell sat alone in the center of the sea with only his partner's waving, grinning corpse for company. Doesn't that just sound like an absolute blast? Over those long months, Howell's sanity began to slowly degrade until he was finally rescued from that utter hell. After returning home, Howell's family was shocked at his condition. Severely emaciated, his personality appeared to have changed drastically. In the end, it would take Hal many years to fully recover. Due to this horrific incident, the rules of lighthouse keeping would be changed forever. No longer would it be only two men manning the keep. Ever after, at least three men were required so that nothing like this would ever occur again.